We are continuing our series with the title, The Mind, The Arena of Faith, and it's based upon a book written by our very own Apostle Frederick Casey Price. Uh, <clears throat> when we left off last time, um, we were just about to get into the part that I thought was just going to be a little bit racy, which is always interesting for folks, but <clears throat> to make sure that we remember exactly some of the things we talked about last time, which is very important. Um, I'm not going to do a long review. It'll probably be about a minute and a half, but I definitely do want to take some time to do that. One of the things that we went over and talked about was the fact that, well, you know what? Before I do that, I'm going to do this, because I think this is good, and I want to do it for a specific reason. Um, we talked about, we always, through this whole thing, we've been talking about our armor, and the armor of God is what? The word of God. We've definitely shared that. And the last time, uh, I mentioned again that Apostle Paul said that we could use our armor against three specific things. And I also re-emphasized four special principles that we need to be aware of. And we spent some time on those four principles. So I want you to now tell me what those four principles are. Which means that somebody's got to know what they are. <laughs> okay. Yes. Thoughts always. Thoughts always precede actions, yes. And the second one? Okay, you got it. Okay, the second one is knowledge. Ignorance. Right. Faith and Right. Okay, very good. Okay, so I'll finish the sentences of it all, because in case you weren't here. Thoughts always precede actions. Okay, because in order for us to act, we have to first think about it. That's the only way that's going to work. Knowledge and its proper use wins battles. Because obviously if you have knowledge but you use it improperly, it's not going to work. In other words, if you want to heat up your food and you put it in the oven but you forget to turn the oven on and you can come back an hour later, the food will still be cold because you obviously need to turn the oven on, okay? So for us to have knowledge of the word, we must know how to properly use it or otherwise we're not going to win. The third one is ignorance and victory are impossible roommates. Because if you have knowledge of something and you're not ignorant of it, and then of course you use it properly, you're gonna do what? Be victorious. And lastly, faith and unbelief. And the reason why that is so important is because we know that faith and unbelief cannot occupy the same space. But we also know that in order for us to be effective in using our armor, which is the word of God, we have to first believe that word, correct? Okay, now listen. I know we had a beautiful day, and I know it was warm outside, and I know everybody's nice and cozy and comfortable, but this is Bible study where it's going to be interactive, so you can feel free to get involved, okay? Because it's kind of like everybody's like, uh, you know, and I mean, this is, it's exciting. <laughs> So anyway, that's how come we say faith and unbelief is the fourth one. So that brought us up to this point. Okay, great. Now, the other thing we went over that's extremely important is that we know that every Christian who has a Bible ought to be free because they should have knowledge of the word. They should know what their full armor is. They should put it on every day. They should walk in it and all of that. But yet and still, we also recognize that that's not the case because some people only know the word intellectually. And if you know it intellectually and don't have practice in it, and I <laughs> mentioned it a little bit on Sunday for a different reason, but it's just like with anything else. You can go to anybody who has a job of any kind here. There's somewhere in the back office a manual of operation on how you're supposed to do that given job. However, if you actually go to the people 
doing the job, they may be doing it a little bit different than that manual of operation. Because the manual of operation is giving you a wonderful little guideline, it's cute, but it's not always exactly how it's going to be. I'll give you this example. Now, why do I use children? Because I have children, so it just works. For instance, they have this new thing out, which I thought was so cute. They tell you that babies have to have tummy time which means you're supposed to take some time and put them on their tummy. But when you put them to sleep at night, the new way thing is they're supposed to sleep on their backs. Now, babies wake up, okay, yeah, I know. Okay, but the, the mode of operandi, or what the manual would say now, is that you only allow them to have tummy time a certain period of the day, and the rest of the time they're supposed to sleep on their back because they're concerned with SIDS, which is, you know, sudden infant death and all the rest of this. So they've come up with this. Well, I have three grandsons currently, and my daughter believed that because this is what it said, and, you know, that's what she's going to do, and she's intellectual. She's, that's her gift, her intellect, which is a wonderful thing. But then there is something called mother wit, where when you have five kids, I don't really give a care what the manual said. You turn that baby over, put them on their stomach, let them go to sleep, <laughs> okay? And we don't have to be concerned with sudden infant death because why? We are born again spirit-filled believers and our children are strong and victorious and healthy and fine. Let the baby sleep. Oh, no, 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 no. But they said this, and you know, she graduated from Georgetown. She's smart. I'm just the little silly mom who had her. So I'm like, okay. So she'd bring the baby to me at night. And I say, okay. And I smile. I turn that baby, put him on his stomach, he's sleeping for the night. I'm like, I know, I know what I'm talking about. The point that I'm making is, you can know something intellectually, and that's cute and great. You can read manuals, that's wonderful. But you have to apply mother wit, Holy Spirit, common sense, whatever you want to call it, you've got to make the thing work. And there are a lot of Christians who know biblical, they can quote scripture to you, they can tell you everything from an intellectual standpoint, but they do not apply it to their day-to-day -day lives, and this is why they are not successful. Which is why now my daughter has three sons, and guess what, by baby number two, she realized, skip what the manual says, let me put this baby on his stomach and let him go to sleep. The point being is we have to remind ourselves and encourage one another and encourage other believers that they have to take the word and apply it. Don't look at it as some little cute manual that you stick up on the shelf somewhere and just pull it down when you're trying to figure out what you're supposed to do. Apply it, whatever it is that you know. You may not know every single scripture. That's okay. What you do know, you hold on to it, you apply it, and you make it work in your life. So that was something that we went over. And Paul specifically tells us that there are three things that our armor can protect us against. And we spent some time on this last week. I want to know what are those three things. So raise your hand and tell me what is the first one. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, the first one is the wiles of the devil. Excellent. What's the second one, Mark? Yes, the evil day. Perfect, you're listening, I love it. And the third one? Fire darts. Fire darts, yes. Okay, so the three things that our armor is definitely supposed to protect us against are the wiles of the devil, the evil day, and the fiery darts. And then we talked about how, um, because it says in the Gospel of John, 10th chapter, 10th verse, the thief comes not to... The thief comes not, wait a minute, does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. And we spent some time talking about that. And we always, you've always heard me explain it in a way that he is coming to steal the word because if he can steal the word, he can kill your faith. If he can kill your faith, he can destroy your life. That is true. But I wanted to break it down in a way that made it something that you could relate to more on your day-to-day -day life, to again apply it. So we talked about how one of the things that the enemy will do, and one of the things that he quickly steals from people, is their peace. That's like something that he definitely will try to get at you with. 
And if he can steal your peace, it affects your whole entire mindset. And as we've been talking about, okay, the mind, the what, the arena of faith. Obviously, if your mindset is, is unsettled, if you just don't have peace about something, if you are just all just twisted and, and concerned about things, obviously that's something that is not good. Because if he does that, yes, it affects everything. If you have... If you aren't peaceful, if your whole entire mindset isn't in a state of peace, it can paralyze you actually. It can stop you from going forward to do anything positive in your life. You just kind of stay at a standstill. It can really paralyze your progression. So you just kind of like stay in one spot. Some people call it a rut, you know, where you just stay in one position and it just seems like no matter what you do, you're just right here. You don't ever seem to move forward. Well, that is one thing that the enemy definitely can do and he can steal from you. Another thing that he does, which really concerns me, and he seems to do this more to the ladies or women in general, is he develops inferiority. Now, there's a whole history lesson that can go through that, and we're really not going to address that now. But if you look at society and look at how you open up any fashion magazine, and the fashion magazine decides what you're supposed to look like, what you're supposed to wear, what size you're supposed to be, how long, if you have a baby, you're supposed to snap back into shape, because they show you these people who are celebrities who give birth, and then a week later they look like, oh, my goodness, they never even had a baby. Well, they don't tell you about the cool sculpting that they went and had, or the liposuction that they went and had, or when they gave birth here in suite number A, oh, they had the baby and three hours later in suite number B, the plastic surgeon was there to do his little thing. They don't tell you that. So you sit home and you come home and you're trying to figure out, okay, it takes six weeks for the uterus to go down. Why is it that I'm coming out of the hospital and I'm still wearing maternity clothes because my jeans don't fit like the person that I looked at who in a week was back in her regular clothes. They, they are giving you a con. And somewhere along the line, we have to be able to decipher what the con is and see clearly. And it, it really gets to me because I understand that the world doesn't see it. They're not supposed to. They don't have the Holy Spirit. They're just following along with it, whatever the enemy is giving them. But we are believers. We have the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to be able to read between the lines, if you will, and look and say, okay, that's not physically possible. Because I don't give a care who you are. It still takes, what do you think they do? Stick a pen in the uterus and just make it go down? God created it. They can't do that. So something is awry. And we're supposed to see it. And then we're supposed to encourage young people. Ladies, all of us who are in here who are over 35, and believe me, I believe there are some, okay? If you're over 35, you know a young person who is under 35. What does it say in the word? We are supposed to encourage them. We're supposed to share things with them. We're supposed to tell them. We're not supposed to keep it as the best kept secrets and let them struggle. And men, it's the same thing. There are things you can tell some young men who don't know. You need to explain it to them. Anyway, whoever that's meant for, that wasn't in my notes, but whatever, <laughs> okay? It's there for something. So anyway, another thing that can happen, and we did talk about this, is how a lot of people, and it's not just young people, this is actually a lot of adults, are not being able to understand <laughs> what the enemy is doing because he is stealing from them, yes. He's affecting their mindset, yes. And there are a lot of people who commit suicide. And they're not just young people. We have adults who are literally committing suicide. And the only way that they can do that is that somewhere there's a breakdown in their thought process. There's a breakdown in what they're thinking about. There is absolutely no reason in the world, nothing is so bad that you have to take your life. Even if you did something and had to go to jail, our jails are the most ridiculous, sophisticated jail. I mean, jails in other countries are horrible, where they make them literally sleep sleep on slabs that look like who you wouldn't put your dog out there. That's what they have to sleep on. Our jail, some people I think personally get arrested just to go to jail because they have some place to stay, they look at TV, they take courses, they eat three square meals a day. I mean, come on. So I'm just saying there is nothing so bad that you should feel as if you have to take your life. But if the enemy can keep talking to you and making you believe the junk he comes up with, you might put yourself in that kind of position, and that's not good. And we realize that everything, everything, everything originates in the mind. 
and we have to be able to discern. This is why discernment should almost be part of your daily confession. You need to be able to discern the things that you're hearing all the time so that you don't trip up and fall into the lies of the enemy. Because <laughs> since everything starts in the mind, you have to stop and think about it. Relationships you may have had with people, whether it's friends, family members, coworkers, spouses, they can be destroyed, killed, and stolen by the enemy simply through the thoughts, ideas, and suggestions he puts in one's mind. Because the mind is a very powerful thing. <laughs> but we can take comfort in knowing that Bible knowledge, if used properly, there is no wile of the enemy, evil day, or fiery dart that can successfully assail us and have victory over us. But we have to know that. Now, because of negative thoughts, marriages are totally wrecked. Parent-children relationships are destroyed, all because of out-of-control minds, minds that are not governed and guided by the Holy Spirit. Now, this is something that really concerns me, and especially in the body of Christ. There are parents who have lousy relationships with their own children, and I am convinced a lot of it is because of poor communication, but it's almost like, uh, you hear me say this all the time, we're all giant children because we are children of God and we're not little two and three year olds, but we're still children. And sometimes if we do not take this word of God, which is our armor, and we do not allow ourselves to become mature in the things of God because we have applied it, we sometimes can act infantile ourselves, even when it comes to do it, dealing with our children. Now I will tell you, I as a parent have grown tremendously because I look back and think of how I did things with my eldest child, that by the time I had my last child, I would not even consider doing it the same way. I still continue to learn from my children because I want to be a good student of everything. I want to be the best that I can be. So it doesn't mean that I'm the parent so I'm way up here and you're the child so you're nothing. Now don't get it twisted. I'm not trying to suggest, okay, that my children lord over me and I just sit there and go, yes, no, that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is you can learn from anything if you allow yourself that privilege. That's entirely up to you. So I have grown when it comes to being a parent versus, I mean, because one of the things, I'll just share this with you because this is a mindset that I had that was not correct and I'm sharing it with you because I seem to tell you everything about my life. One of the things that I used to do with my children is I wanted them to do everything right. Meaning because that's what we want. We want them to do things right. But I realized later on that I wasn't giving them the opportunity to feel as if they could make a mistake. That's bad, okay? Because God gives me the ability to make a mistake. I make more than I'd like to think about, but I do. But he still loves me and he's still nice. I always loved my children. They knew that. But I made it difficult for them in that I should have, and I've grown to this point, where they know that I'm the safety net, that their father and I are a safety net for them. We want you to have God's best all the time, but if somewhere along the line you miss it, you can come and tell us you missed it so we can help you and get you back on the right track. That wasn't always the case, because I think sometimes, I know, not think, I know sometimes that they didn't want to come to us and just reveal certain things because they're like, oh boy, because they knew they missed it, but they didn't feel that they could come to us. So why am I sharing that? with you, I'm sharing to, with you something that I did incorrectly so that you can learn from it and you don't do it. So that hopefully you can learn that. Realize you mess up all the time. I know you may think you don't, but you do. And God loves you in spite of it. So you have to be the same way when it comes to your children. And you have to understand, your children, what are they looking for? This is one thing in the ethnicity of African-American people especially that they miss. Every single male child that is born is looking for validation from their father. Now, 
it's true that for many of them it's hard because they may have never known who their father was or they never, may have never met their father. But that doesn't mean that there's not a yearning in there where they're looking for that validation. So because sometimes they don't get it, they're kind of suspended out here and it seems like they don't know what they're, they're trying to figure it out. That's what they're looking for. Even us as females, <laughs> to a certain degree, we're looking for validation too, but we look for it differently. But the point of the matter is, once you start to understand that, and once you open up the word of God, every single thing you need, you can find it there. Because guess what? Once I, well, I understand my situation was a little different because my parents absolutely loved me and I loved them. I had a great relationship with them, but I recognize that that's not everybody's privilege. But will I, what I will say is this, that even if I had not known my parents at all, once I realized that God accepted me for who I am, and he not only just accepted me, he adopted me, he loves me, there is absolutely nothing else that's more important than that. So it's like, we just need to kind of focus on that. But again, I only learned that how? By opening up the word and seeing it was there. Because before then, how would I know? And that's the thing. We have to make sure that we're doing things like that. And we really have to reach out to our young people. There's no way you're going to tell me. The, I have an issue with this 19-year-old who went in here and shot up all these people. Here's why I have an issue. They're saying he had a mental illness. I don't know that it's documented he had a mental, mental illness. I think that's how they're spinning the thing. Now, this is, notice I'm saying, this is Ivy's opinion. Ivy's opinion, OK? I personally think that's the spin they're putting on it. Because we live in a country where they want AR-15s to be sold like Skittles because they make money off of it. So as long as they can keep doing that, they're not going to stop anything. So therefore, we're going to put another spin on it so we can just automatically think this child is pitiful and mentally deranged. He was awfully smart with pulling this whole thing off to be so mentally ill and deranged. So I'm not so quick to buy that, OK? The point is though I will say nobody got a hold of him to give him what he needed. It seems to me that the young man was looking for validation. He was looking for love and he didn't receive it. Now that's something different. The fact that he could go in and buy an AR-15, if he was really somebody who was just so mentally ill, how come he could pull that off? And if he could, again, that's something else we need to look at. But I think there's a spin on it. So just pay attention you know, and see how it all, it, it, that goes back to the Holy Spirit and reading in between the lines. You can't just take whatever somebody tells you on TV and just say, oh, okay, it's all right, because I don't buy that. Anyway, be advised, however, that God is not in the business of thought control. He's not trying to control our minds like little Stepford people where we just go around and do whatever he says. We have our own minds and we are the ones who are responsible for controlling them. So therefore, if you know that you have been redeemed from poverty, sickness, and spiritual death, you need to take license for that. You need to be responsible for that. And you need to act like you know that. And, and you know, live your life that way. So if you're broke all the time and you can't figure out why you have no money, that's on you. That has nothing to do with God because God has already provided it for you. So you need to figure out what adjustment you need to make. And that doesn't mean you need to beat yourself up or that you're a bad person. It just means you need to make some mid-course corrections so you can make some changes in your life so that you can get on top of the situation and be victorious. We also talked about how people do have certain instincts. And we talked about our men and how they, ex they have an instinct that's different. Males are different than females. We're wired differently. And that's a good thing, because if not, we'd just be the same. That would be rather boring, OK? But women are more emotional. So I'll pick on women first before I get on them, because I'm really going to get on them. Um, we're more emotional, OK? And sometimes we can take a little molehill, and I will admit, we can turn it into a mountain. We can put a forest on top of the mountain, add some little snow over there on the side. I mean, we can build this thing into something that is just way over the top. But, okay, along with that bundle comes also a certain intuitiveness that we have 
that men do not have. So you see, one is not better than the other in any way. So understand that. So when I'm talking about the women, men are not better. And when I'm talking about the men, women are not better. But we, we do need to understand the differences so that we can get, bring the best out of what we do possess, OK? We do have a tendency to be that way. We have a tendency sometimes to not know the language of silence. And in relationships, especially marriages, women need to just be quiet, OK? Go into your prayer closet and run your mouth to the Lord. Eventually, he'll tell you to be quiet. But <laughs> give your husband a break, OK? Or if you're in a relationship and you're even dating somebody, still learn the language of silence. Some single women, you're going to always be single because you do not know how to be quiet, OK? You have to be still <laughs> and know that God exists, OK? He will be exalted <laughs> in the earth earth realm, you'll be exhausted. The point is, you just have to kind of shh, be quiet, you know, and you know, you, you'll get a chance to get your point across. You don't always have to beat somebody over the head with it. And sometimes we have a tendency to do that. Okay, well, men, on the other hand, they are single-minded, which is good, because we need that. You know, they're very single-minded. I've told you how when it comes to going to bed, they will just decide, okay, it's time to go to sleep. They'll just go in, drop everything, get in the bed, think nothing else of it. Whereas it takes us, you know, 45 minutes, half an hour. We got to make sure the dishes aren't in the sink. We got to clean the kitchen, make sure the door is locked. We got to go and slather ourselves in 500 pounds of cream because we have convinced that we are supposed to look like these people in the magazines and we're going to try every possible thing to do that. Then we go and get in the bed while they're snoring. We finally get to lie down. Again, there's a big difference in male versus female. However, while they're, they're sleeping, nine times out of ten, I don't know what they're dreaming about. They may not be remember what they're dreaming about, but while they're awake, they usually somewhere in the somewhere in their brain, sex is going to be there, okay? That's, it kind of like drives them. It can get them a little excited real quick, okay? And here is the real big thing. Just like women have to learn the language of silence and learn that that's something about themselves that they have to control, men have to learn to control that instinct when it comes to themselves. And it's obvious whether they have or whether they have not. You can tell if you meet someone and I don't give a care. He could be a rock star, because that seems to get some people, not us, but some people get excited about that. But you see, when you have more money, I call money an amplifier. If you have more money, it's going to help you amplify what you want to do. So therefore, if you're thinking about sex, and that's what you want to do, you might be somebody who even has unprotected sex, and you could have 12 babies all over the country, all over the place. That's not you being in control of your mind. But it happens quite often. Men have choices to make when it comes to that instinct about themselves. They can either choose to control and think with their head up here and not the head below the belt. And they can choose to either do it God's way and marry one woman and be happy with that one woman. They can choose to be single but remain celibate, which is a challenge for many of them. Or they can choose to truly, truly, truly put on their armor and conduct themselves as men of God and control their bodies and be able to go on to whatever the next step is. Now, of course, our kingdom warriors, which is what I like to call the men of God here at Crenshaw, I am believing that they are doing the latter. Only they will know if they are not. Now, so therefore, we are the ones that control our own, own thoughts. And here is the thing. You have to realize the enemy is still going to come after you every single day, every way that he can. And he's going to try to give you some kind of thought, idea, or suggestion to really wreck up your life. That is his job. However, you have to be the one that says you won't permit it. You have to be the one that says that you're not going to be a victim of any circumstance. Too many Christians today are unaware of this fact. And they don't know 
anything about this type of warfare. They really don't, because a lot, of, a lot of churches don't teach the fact that your thought life is where warfare exists. They don't know. You'll hear people saying stuff, well, the devil was running after me all the time. What do you mean he's running after you? Turn around and tell him to back off. I mean, you know, but they don't know because this is what they're hearing from the pulpit. So they're, you know, this is what they're being taught, so they're going on that. But we know, okay, because we are in the teaching ministry of Apostle Frederick C. K. C. Price, that we're not the victim of any kind of circumstances. And that's a wonderful thing. Because <laughs> if you don't understand the weapons the enemy is using in his attacks, if you don't know that, you are clearly, I don't care how many times you come here to Bible study or come to worship service, if you don't start understanding the word, applying it to your life and putting on your armor, as much as I love you, you still will be destroyed. You've got to understand it. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians. And we're going to look at chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And we're going to look at verses 8 through 11. And let me know when you're there. OK, great. Now, I'm going to share it with you first out of the New International Version. And it says, I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. Another reason, OK, let me back up and explain this, because unless you really know what this is talking about, this is when Paul is writing to the church at Corinth because he had been going around teaching and preaching the word, teaching and preaching the gospel. However, and I'm sure some of us could relate to this kind of thing happening, where there was this church and some people were doubting him and doubting what he was saying and they were chatting around and, and talking and, and starting a whole bunch of mess, okay? And he was approaching them now and saying, <clears throat> the person who initiated all of this talk and all of this mess, we're going to forgive him. We're going to take the high road. We're not going to get down there and, and act all ugly like they are. So this is what he's talking about. So when it says, I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him, he's talking about the person and persons who were running off at the mouth and saying all these negative things, you know? So like you may know some people who may have said some negative things about you, but you've chosen to take the high road and love them the same way that God has loved you. So that's what's being talked about in this. I wanted you to understand that. So anyway, back to the eighth verse. I urge you therefore to reaffirm your love for him. Another reason I wrote you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. Anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan may not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. If we look at it in the easy to read version, it says this, so I beg you to show him that you love him. That is why I wrote to you. I wanted to test you and see if you obey in everything. If you forgive someone, then I also forgive them. And what I have forgiven, if I had anything to forgive, I forgave it for you and Christ was with me. I did this so that Satan would not win anything from us. We know very well what his plans are. The Living Bible says, please show him now that you still do love him very much. I wrote to you as I did so that I could find out how far you would go in obeying me. When you forgive anyone, I do too. And whatever I have forgiven to the extent that this affected me too has been by Christ's authority and for your good. A further reason for forgiveness is to keep from being outsmarted by Satan, for we know what he's trying to do. Lastly, I'm going to read it to you out of the message, but I want you to think about that. When you find it so hard to forgive somebody who has done wrong to you, understand you are making it easy for the enemy to come in and swoop down on you, okay, and just make a mess out of the whole entire situation. You need to be, if you notice, all three of those translations talked about obedience in the very beginning. He was writing to them to see just whether they would choose to be obedient. Obedient to what? Obedient to the word of God. Obedient to love in spite of what had been 
done to them. And if you take a minute and really stop and think, there may have been times in your life that you did not forgive somebody or it took you a long time to forgive them because you were holding on to that thing for as long as you possibly could. And if you look back at it, you will see you were the one who lost more than them because you don't ever need to hold anything. It is just not that worth it. You are blocking the blessings of God. You're blocking, you're, you're putting a big obstacle in the middle of your relationship with your heavenly father and you don't ever want to do that. So looking at this in the message Bible it says now regarding the one who started all this the person in question who caused all this pain I want you to know that I am not the one injured in this as much as with a few exceptions all of you. So I don't want to come down too hard. What the majority of you agreed to as punishment is punishment enough. Now is the time to forgive this man and help him back on his feet. If all you do is pour on the guilt, you could very well drown him in it. My counsel now is to pour on the love. The focus of my letter wasn't on punishing the offender, but on getting you to take responsibility for the health of the church. So if you forgive him, I forgive him. Don't think I'm carrying around a list of personal grudges. The fact is that I'm joining in with your forgiveness as Christ is with us, guiding us. After all, we don't want to unwittingly give Satan an opening for yet more mischief. mischief. We're not oblivious to his sly ways. So the point being is, we know that he's trying to do things. We have to make sure that we don't give him any opportunity or any place. And that's basically what that's saying. Now remember, Paul was speaking 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago was when this was written. However, he was talking about himself and those with whom he fellowshiped, as I just mentioned. Now here we are 2,000 years removed. And can we say that we're not ignorant of his devices? Thank God we're not ignorant. Or let's say it this way. We shouldn't be ignorant because we have our hands. We have in our hands the living word of God. You've got the word of God in your hands. You just need to open it up and find out what's going on. And one of the things that I hate to, to see and sometimes people even bank on it. If you want to hide something from someone, especially a person who's African American, put it in a book. Because we don't, and it's sad. I, I, I mean, it's really sad. We don't encourage even our children to read. I mean, come on. How many, you know, we, we think about new babies that are being born. How many people think about starting their library? How many people even think about buying them a Bible? Oh, no, we're going to buy them everything else. We'll get them baby Jordans, but we won't get them the word. Something to think about, <laughs> okay? And here's another thing you have to keep in mind. The devil's tactics, they're not a secret. They are just not. His mode of operation is the same toward everyone. And we can all know the weapons he uses because he's not a creative being. He has no new ideas, you know? I mean, I happen to like basketball, and I think it's so cute whenever they have the little timeouts, you know, you see them bring out the little whiteboard and they're sitting there and they're writing little plays on it, you know, to try to get people to do different things. The enemy doesn't even have the whiteboard. He's doing the same pitiful little things he's always done from 2,000 years and some now. He doesn't even have a playbook. So we should definitely be on top because we know the things he's going to do. But again, if you don't open the book, you have no idea. He has no new ideas. Our enemy is both knowable and predictable. And that gives us the advantage because we know that. We know exactly what he's going to do. So the question remains, what are we to use our armor against? How does the enemy come against us? What exactly are his wiles? his evil day, his fiery darts. I suggest to you that there are three things. What do you think the three things are? Thoughts, ideas, and suggestions. There you go, that's it. So these wiles, evil days, and fiery darts are in the arena of what? The mind. That's the site of the warfare. It's not at your job, it's not in your home, it starts in your mind. That's where the warfare is taking place. That's the place that either defeat or victory will occur. 
The confrontation with thoughts, ideas, and suggestions is totally unavoidable. There's nothing you're gonna do to change that. It's a warfare we will be engaged in for the rest of our lives. Therefore, our diligence in maintaining our thought life will directly determine the quality of our lives. Now, I will say this. There are a lot of us, as I said before, who have not had the traditional storybook life of mother and father and the white picket fence and the little pet dog and you know all is well and the bills are paid and everything is great. Everybody has not had that, okay? There are quite a few people who quite frankly have had almost the opposite. There are a lot of people who were happy to have a roof over their head, but they might not have always had everything they wanted to eat. They might have known what it was like to go to bed hungry. They might have, you know, had their mom give them a little piece of meat to go along with some greens, and they'd see her make some <laughs> gravy out of some flour she had laying around and sop it up with some bread. And that was their life. Now, I'm not saying that that's a horrible life, but what I'm saying to you is it is a life that's different than the first one that I mentioned, okay? There are some people who never knew who their mother was. There are some people who never knew who their father was. There are some people who grew up in one foster home after another foster home after another foster home and never even knew who their parents were, where they came from. You know, there are some people who were adopted and there are some people who have struggled and wrestled with why they were adopted because maybe they don't know what the circumstances were. Some people who are adopted feel abandoned because they feel as if their mother didn't care for them enough to keep them, which could be the total opposite of why she put them up for adoption. Maybe she knew that she wasn't in a position to take care of them and love them properly, so that's why. But if you are wrestling with these things, because remember, where is the, the, <laughs> where is the battlefield? It's in our mind. So therefore, you're gonna have an enemy that's gonna constantly, if you're that child, make you feel all of those things and then some. And people then find that they are, as, like I said, we're giant children, as they are growing into adulthood, they are looking for that void to be filled. And you will find, and uh, the apostle really lays out his heart in this book. And he tells you about the horrendous life that he had. But you see, I'm not one, I, I, that's his story to tell, okay? So therefore, for me, if you really want to hear his story, you can read it, <laughs> okay? But I'm not, I, I don't, I'm not going to tell his story. I'm going to tell things I know about because I'm more effective with that. I can be more authentic with that. Now for me, I am truly blessed because I did not have that, but I do know of a lot of people and I have had friends where all of those things do exist. Okay, where they didn't know who their parents were or whatever the case may be. And for young people, because at one point I had a job where I was a manager and dealt with a lot of young people and I would see them come in day after day after day. And being a, a young person, when I say a young person, somebody who's maybe between the ages of 15 and 25, those are some challenging years because they are just starting to figure out who they are and, and just trying to make it through this thing called life. Some of them are just trying to get out of high school. Some of them are thinking about college and college is a whole nother enchilada for them, okay? And it's, it's difficult. And for most of them, because every child that is born is given life from God. God is the only giver of life. And God is what? He is love. So it's quite natural that every human being being that is born is looking for what? They are looking for love. And you will see, and if you take the time to think about your own life, you will see where you may have from time to time look for love in all the wrong places. And there are people who have gotten married, and they have gotten married all for the wrong reason. There are children, when I, well, I shouldn't say children, young people <laughs> who have had babies out of wedlock on purpose just because they wanted somebody to love them. But can you imagine what is their life is gonna be and how it's gonna be set up if somebody doesn't get across and give them the word to change some things around? And yeah, there are people who are young, 
There are young men, and this is partially part of what the apostle is talking about even in his own life, but there are young men who will go and they're really man whores. That's a terrible way to put it, but it's really what they're doing. They're sleeping around all over America, but they're not doing it. They're not even doing it maliciously. They're, they're, uh, there are some that do it maliciously, but I'm talking about the young man who he grew up where he might have been that latchkey kid. He didn't have anybody who looked over his homework when he came home. He didn't have anybody to make sure he got up on time in the morning and that his clothes were ironed and he was prepared for school. And he might not have had anybody even say, you know what, you're doing a good job, little Johnny. I really do love you. He might not have gotten that at all. So therefore, as soon as he starts seeing that girls are attractive, he's looking for somebody to pay some attention to him. Somebody to say, oh, you really do look nice or you really did do that well. And the next thing he knows, he's in way beyond what he thought because because again, he's getting what? The thoughts, the ideas, and suggestions coming from the enemy. He's already starting to realize, oh yeah, I am a man, and some things are starting to happen, and this little girl, she seems to be paying some attention to me, and the next thing you know, he goes ahead and he gets in bed with that little girl, okay? Here's the thing, though, and this is what people do not get. I don't give a care if you know anything about the word or you don't know anything about the word. When you share that type of intimate relationship with another human being, you are putting your mind, your soul, and your body, all of it. Why do you think it says when people marry, they become one flesh? It is, that's true. It's a spiritual transaction. It is not just the physical sex and it's a jump off and I'm gone. No, it is not. This is why women are wrecked up mentally for a long period of time. And, but so are men. See, men are, they're cool. They don't let us know the emotions that they're feeling that they're going through all the time. But they, in a lot of ways, can be even more sensitive than women. See, women, we talk it out. We'll go into the store, and we don't even know you from Adam, but we'll sit there and tell you our whole problem. We'll tell you everything about it, you know, this, that, and the other thing. We will counsel each other and don't even know who we are, okay? Men don't do that, but they hold that thing and it affects them and it doesn't affect them all the time in a positive way because they get upset as a matter of fact there is a young man that I know of I don't know him personally but I know someone who does know him personally yesterday was the world's version or the world called the Valentine's Day that's a whole nother thing a whole lot of pressures on people this young man was about to commit suicide he's only like 28 years old because where he works, he was talking to this girl who was actually, well, the girl was wrong, because she was talking to him and allowing him to take her out on dates and stuff, but she was actually going out with somebody else. And she really didn't want to be bothered with him. So here comes Valentine's Day, you know, with the flowers and the candy, all this stuff they do. And she didn't want any of his because she was going with the other guy. But this man was so hurt that he was just devastated. And he literally put in a phone call to his sister, who then had to kind of go sit with him. Now granted, there obviously are some challenges there. He's been hurt for a long time, I get it. But he even contemplated really taking his own life. And you would think, that's a man, but it's still something that meant something to him. Oh, my time is up. <laughs> anyway. We'll continue next time. Thanks for joining us. Our hope is that you received something that you can apply to your life and strengthen your faith. At Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, we believe that the Word of God is practical for everyday application. If you'd like to support the ministry with your tithe and offering, you can mail them to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. We also offer the convenience of mobile and online giving. It's safe and secure. Try it now. From your smartphone, simply text East G to 28950 and follow the prompts. You can even specify a designation for your gift. Text East G for general donation, East T for tithe, East O for offering, or East AL to donate to the Apostles Library. Each transaction needs to be its own individual text message. You can also visit our website, CrenshawChristianCenterEast.org, and click the Give tab to begin your experience. 
set up recurring donations, or give one-time gifts. This giving method is easy to use, safe and secure, and requires a one-time registration only. After your first gift, giving will be completely simple. Simply text East G to 28950 with your information securely stored. We appreciate your continued support and stand in agreement with you for the manifold return on your life. Thanks again for watching. And remember, we walk by faith, not by sight. We would like you, our viewers and partners, to join us in honoring the legacy of the Apostle by making a donation to the Apostle Frederick K. C. Price Library. The library will be on the grounds of the Faith Dome in Los Angeles, California, and it will be open to the public. It will be a place of study, learning, and research, available for anyone desiring to further their knowledge and understanding of the Christian faith. Visitors will also have a chance to learn more about our founder and his impact on the body of Christ and the world at large. You can mail your donations to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. If you are giving by check, be sure to designate in the memo area, Apostles Library. If you have Crenshaw Christian Center envelopes, you can mark AL on the envelope. You can also donate via your smartphone by texting EAST AL to 28950 and follow the prompts. We thank you in advance for your support. And as always, we stand in agreement for the manifold return in your life.